Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. You've understood we're at an Horasis event. We have all the time uh, zones of the world present today for 45 minutes about uh, the ASEP, uh, the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Agreement, which uh, gathers uh, 30% of the world uh, GDP in uh, one of the largest and if not the largest ambitious free trade uh, agreement. We have uh, today with us uh, Yasuno Naito, Lise Makole, Pranjal Sharma and Ricardo Melendez Ortiz. Ricardo, we can uh, see you are with us in the audience. We give you the mic now. Ricardo, can you speak? Can you be with us now? I think it's, it's on its way. Uh, without further ado, uh, the ASEP uh, got signed a year ago. Uh, as I said, uh, concerning 30% of uh, the uh, world GDP, a sizable a uh, chunk of the global population because it hosts, uh, it uh, concerns con countries as diverse as China, uh, Japan, Australia. It has 14 countries uh, having joined it. And interestingly, uh, at the time negotiations started, uh, the USA were in the discussion under Obama. And then Trump left uh, the discussion and the treaty got signed uh, just a month or a little bit before uh, Biden got uh, access to power, but was already on the way to power. So needless to say, this uh, treaty has been widely documented and widely discussed on the political side, on the political aspects, but it also means business. Uh, uh, and I'm happy that we have today a varied panel uh, that involves people in business in the field, people who are analysts for governments, people who are uh, also in governments or commentators. And uh, without further ado, I'll give the floor to Yasunori Naito, whom I think will start with the business dimension of the ASEP, which should not be forgotten after all. Yes, Nuri, you have the floor. I will not introduce the panel. I've left this to each of you for a couple of minutes of introduction and bring your points, and we'll have a round of discussion. Thank you, Israel. So let me introduce myself first. I'm living in Singapore. My name is Yasunori Naito, originally from originally from Japan. I'm really honored to be here, and I heard this is held in Kita Kyushu City. So glad to have process in Japan this time. Okay, um, I'm living in Singapore and helping the Japanese corporates invest in Southeast Asia and China, and also helping uh, foreign, foreign, for, for, foreign for Japanese, so the local companies to expand in Japan too. So I'm pretty much interested in how RCEP is influencing my client Japanese corporates in ASEAN region and China, and also in Japan headquarters. So for me, I have spoken with some of the Japanese companies who uh, might be interested in uh, ALSEP. And as you audience might know that in ASEAN has an uh, individual FTA with other countries, and Japan has also FTA with ASEAN. So what is the additional benefit for the Japanese company is the most interesting topics for the most of the Japanese corporates. So in this session, I'd like, to I'd like to explain how Japanese corporates are reacting as of now, how they are preparing for the RCEP or not preparing for RCEP yet. So I will share that situation in this session. Uh, Jerry, you are muted. As you have the floor, why do you do it now? Okay, sure. I, I think that Lisa or other members could explain how the outfit is like. No, no, for please just start with that. Let's start from business, then we'll uh, we'll complete the the row. Okay, sure. All right. So, okay. So as I mentioned, Japan has uh, bilateral 
or international FTAs with ASEAN countries, and uh, which allows Japan, Japanese companies to take advantage of preferential tariffs already. But the Japanese corporates or Japanese government is kind of favor of RCEP because China and Korea, with whom we don't have an FTA yet, were included in the RCEP. And, and Japan is also missing India's, India's withdrawal for the RCEP right now. So you might know that the previously, maybe this, this year or last year, the sound Japanese analysts and the domestic media showed some concern about RCEP because the initial discussion was led by China government. So some of the Japanese analysts say that it might not be a good idea to join the RCEP. But actually, the, um, as long as I, I heard from my experts in this space, this is not like a led by China thing. It's more like led by ASEAN and China and uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Mut they have the mutual interest on this. Okay. And, uh, yeah, in fact, if you look at the history of the uh, RCEP, Yasunori, uh, it has uh, somehow, on this can be debated uh, in this panel, but it has somehow built on earlier bilateral treaties that was that were started by uh, Australia uh, uh, at the onset. Uh, my question would be to you, as you focus on on businesses and companies, has it made a difference for companies? Because uh, there were debates uh, that are well known. Now we're one year already into uh, this treaty. Of course, it's a very special year because um, COVID uh, has been there. We are post-COVID, past-COVID, depends on how people look at it, but the value chain and the supply chains are still disturbed by COVID. Uh, and uh, our session is itself rightly and aptly named post-COVID uh, impact of RCEP. Which is the impact you've seen on the field? Has it helped? restarting the uh, supply chains uh, after the COVID, uh, the ASAP Treaty? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the questions. So I think that most of the Japanese are still uh, evaluating, reviewing the impact of RCEP right now. Because as I mentioned, the most of the Japanese corporates already enjoyed the FTA's um, preferential tariffs already. So that is why whether they could have an additional uh, benefit from RCEP is still an open point for them. And the reason why I mentioned, okay, so that's the, the situation. And I could address that the impact of COVID-19 situations, that because of the hike of the cost of the sea logistics, because of the shortage of containers, the, the sea cost is getting higher and higher. So some of the Japanese logistics companies trying to benefit from this by using a land transportation in China and ASEAN countries, among China and ASEAN countries. So to do that, I think the RCEP new um, procedure might benefit for them to, to use. So that's the, the influence of COVID. Thank you. That's very clear. Lisa, Lisa Macaulay, when we prepared, uh, you mentioned that you would want to flag why the ASEP is uh, important as compared to other regional agreements in terms of uh, tariff preferences, uh, which uh, were already mentioned by Yasunari, supply of services, flexibility of movement, facility of investment. I mean, a series of issues we expect from many treaties, but you seemed in the preparation of our discussion today in, to imply that they're especially important in the RCEP. So I'll hand you the hand over the floor to you uh, to give us a point on that, uh, maybe to explain how they are specifically important in the post-COVID uh, recovery or attempt to recover. And of course, uh, please start by introducing yourself. Lisa, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Well, my name is Lisa McCauley. I'm the CEO of the Global Trade Professionals Alliance, which is 
a global entity set up to break down barriers to trade and to facilitate small to medium engagement into supply chains through various mechanisms, which I'm not going to waste everybody's time on. Um, I, I think one of the, just before I start on answering your question first, though, is when talking about RCEP in that um, what, what we're talking about is that a lot of countries are still in the process of um, rectifying this agreement. Australia has done that process, but in essence, legally, it doesn't come into force until January next year. So the rules are not really going to apply for Australian businesses until next year. Jan basically January next year. So looking at sort of where the benefits have been to date aren't something I think we can actually really do because a lot of countries have to go through a similar rectification process then they have a time frame of implementation and our implementation is going to happen in January, <clears throat> although it's gone through our Senate and has been um, legally rectified. But the interesting thing that I think on RCEP is that we're comparing this a little bit to the CTPP program because obviously a lot of the same countries are involved in it. We just have a bigger stakeholder now at the table in RCEP. And, but one of the, the biggest outcomes that has come from, from RCEP, and I think that informs a lot of where discussions are going on plurilateral agreements around the world, to be honest. And then how do plurilateral agreements influence what is happening in the multilateral debate at the WTO is that this agreement has really pushed certain aspects in a way in which I think we want trade agreements to be negotiated going forward in that it's tackling something, for example, like a single set of rules for origin. That is a massive game changer for business. I don't think people quite understand it. I think the UK businesses quite understand it right now because they're literally going through all of this with um, never having to deal with rules of origin before um, in Europe. But the point of which you get to to a single set of rules of origin, uh, that that's a big game changer for, for particularly SMEs. It really actually helps transform their business and um, the way in which they can uh, do business. It's the same with some of the other aspects of this agreement that deal with e-commerce, which is obviously the most important area that we're entering into when it comes to looking at new trade rules for, for e-commerce. Um, but also it has an SME chapter. And so it prioritizes SMEs within the region, which again is really quite important. So from my summarization of where I think the agreement is so important, and we, we will be measuring these outcomes, I think, in, a, in the next couple of years, is it's put SMEs at the heart of an agreement. And that doesn't often happen, but it puts them at the heart of an agreement in a practical way that's actually practically going to have tangible benefits. Uh, thank you, Lisa. It's all very uh, clear and precise and detailed. And you were very right to mention that it's not been ratified uh, yet. So uh, surely one should not jump into the conclusion. And one minor question uh, I, I could ask you is whether there is a risk it's not getting rat ratified. But I call it a minor question. Uh, compared to your major point, which is that we're entering into a new set of rules. So as we're entering into a new set of rules, I, I'm back to my previous questions. Um, even though it's not been ratified, uh, the time for ratification is also a time for companies to adjust themselves, to prepare themselves to the entry into force of a new uh, agreement, as you mentioned, at least two key points on the rules of origin, which is one. Second, on the uh, impact it will have or the opportunities we will have for SMEs. Uh, do you observe, have you observed uh, on the field or in the debates in the region, uh, have you observed an accelerated preparation or preparedness uh, on those two fronts by companies, even though it's not been ratified? 
Yes, yeah, so sorry, I should clarify. It has been ratified, but then in some countries it takes a while for that yeah. ratification process to then happen. Uh, it just depends on the country. Uh, we, we've ratified it in Australia. It's just that the legislation doesn't kick in until January. Um, but in terms of preparedness, yes, I, I mean, I have seen, seen, seen it, but I do believe that Government organisations are often pretty bad at explaining the benefits of these policy outcomes. It often uh, needs to be distilled down into to chunks of information and education that businesses can really understand, because it's not like they're going to sit and read through chapters and chapters of a policy and legal document. They're running their businesses. Um, so, you know, what it takes is, is a need to... To, to, to distill the information down to what the benefits are for SMEs. Um, and I, I, I've done a lot of work on that in the past um, because you have to break it down into language that they understand and information that they can absorb in a more easily sort of digestible way. Um, but, I, you know, that's a collective for each of the individual countries to do, but they should be working together on, on, on doing that and sharing information. Um, plus, I, I believe that one factor that we are going to have to overcome on this is going to be the fact that this regional agreement, just like CTPP, there are so many other agreements in this region, either bilaterally, through um, ANSVATAR, through CTPP. I, I, you know, so how does it? How does a business actually weigh up then what is the best agreement for them to take advantage of? We're going to have to distill and break that down for them. And that's where confusion will set in, in some areas. Yeah, you, you are right. There are so many uh, agreements, bilateral, regional, sub-regional uh, in the world, but especially in this region. I remember nearly 15 years ago, an academic had tried to plot them on a map and there were so many uh, threads, ah. you know. He just concluded that this looked like a uh, noodle's bowl, you know. So for sure, for the companies, it's hard to figure out their way through that. Maybe also for governments, as you aptly, aptly mentioned. Uh, Pranjal, Pranjal Sharma, you're a, an observer, you're a commentator, you're also an advisor. Uh, the job of people like you is to make uh, complex things look uh, simple and sometimes... Of course, uh, simple things not to be uh, overlooked. Uh, how would you take it up further from the conversation we had on the airsep itself, on the complexity, on the advantages it has, and on the need to communicate? Uh, and of course, you are based in India and from India. Uh, the elephant is in the room. India uh, and the airsep would be my uh, second question. You have the floor. Uh, Pranjal, introduce you uh, at the start and, and then you have the floor. Thank you, Joel. Uh, it's great to be here again. Uh, and it's good to see uh, Lisa. I think we had we were in the same session last year. Uh, of course, virtual. I hope that someday we'll all meet personally and good to see Ricardo too. Uh, next, the next spring, next spring in uh, Cascais, we'd be, uh, we'd be presidential, uh, Frank told me just yesterday. Right, right. No, I mean, you know, I've met Ricardo and all of you except you Kinori, but hopefully we'll all be in person in a post-COVID world. Uh, I, I write and, uh, you know, I've been an author, columnist. I'm also serving on the boards of uh, some organizations. Uh, you know, RCEP and India have a very, very interesting relationship. Uh, India was part of the RCEP negotiations for many years. But uh, I will break my response in two parts. One is... Uh, basically explaining why India is not in, in RCEP and what the perceptions are. Um, and India was very enthusiastic. But, you know, it's like if I want to go and have lunch with a friend or have dinner with somebody or go on, you know, do business with somebody, I need to know that person well. I need to trust that person well. Uh, and the first part of RCEP uh, that India has uh, uh, chosen not to be part of is that because China has been very aggressive in it, and for various, uh, uh, you know, actions that China has taken uh, on India, which India and China, they, both the governments have have a very strong cold economic war going on in the last three years, especially 
in the post covid uh, world uh, that there was no way that india would join something which had a dominant uh, influence of china uh, especially at a time when the trust levels between the two countries are at historic lows uh, so you know that's the that's the fundamental part of it i'm not getting into the economic part of it this is the atmospherics and the context why you don't enter into a partnership with anybody if you don't have a level of comfort or a trust and i think unless that happens nothing will move there is also the other reason the economic reason which is that uh, india has had uh, ftas with several members of the asean countries and uh, what it has discovered is that uh, fundamentally india is not has not gained from the ftas in the sense that its exports haven't risen but its imports have risen and in that sense it has uh, created uh, uh, you know problems for its own uh, small organizations and companies these are referred to smes and for india uh, smes are a very big concern they are roughly 80% of the economic activity of the country uh, through informal or through connection to the formal uh, industrial economy so one thing that india has to do before entering any such uh, uh, agreements is to strengthen itself internally and i think that is uh, that should be a priority for the government how can it make the smes more competitive more efficient how can we ensure that more capital flows uh, better skilling and facilities cost of manufacturing can be can be reduced and until that happens uh, i think india would be reluctant to go ahead with too many free trade agreements or joining a large gathering like rcep and you know in in the sense india has the comfort level to be able to do that because i have no hesitation in saying that india is the world's largest free market democracy uh it's a great market for the rest of the world and the great market if you are a big market you have the confidence and you have the privilege and perhaps the strength to set the rules of the game and to that extent uh, india is now taking a position saying that well we may not be able to export as much to other countries but i can tell you that uh that we are also not going to be an easy market for you to access because cheap imports uh especially which are subsidized uh by various countries including uh, uh from china uh, is a problem please understand that countries in europe have are, are giving huge billion dollar a day kind of subsidies for their agriculture products similarly china is is there so much opacity we don't know what exactly is the cost of production and therefore the kind of products which are entering india and not just india actually the other uh, parts of the world and you know that's a concern in most uh, uh, markets too that are we getting are we really competing on equal terms or are we competing on on unequal terms open market democracies it's easy to see what's going on in a opaque dictatorial country uh, like china it's difficult to know what's really going on and therefore there is a concern in all democracies across the world about doing business with china now of course china is very profitable it's also a big market and companies have benefited but the question is what are the terms of engagement so i'll pause here joel and and you know to say that until the terms of engagement are clear uh, and there is trust i think rcep is not going to take off very soon no thank you pranjal that's uh that's very uh, straightly put uh before moving to ricardo uh please uh, allow me um, a follow up question uh, pranjal uh you mentioned china mentioned china is one of the numerous countries in the asia uh you mentioned the indian smes and the unpreparedness let me I'm not quoting you I'm claiming it the unpreparedness of the Indian SMEs if I if for few seconds I, I play the economist in the room um for moving to the real economist Ricardo uh well can't we say that entering the ASEP would force the Indian SMEs to get ready on the first front and second of all that the single uh, unified set of rules of origin uh, which uh, uh, which lisa was mentioning 
is a tremendous opportunity for an economy like India and for what you call a, 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 a democracy, democracy market, you know, um, uh, um, s- democratic market. So uh, India being uh, such a diverse economy would benefit from that. And can't we say that the benefit would be reaped by the SMEs, which are more local in essence? Huge question. You have two minutes until we move to Ricardo, but I think it's an important debate. Beyond uh, first question uh, on on uh, the uh, benefiting and the SMEs benefiting. Yes, in theory, yes. But uh, the fact is that uh, RCEP is is not accepting some of the proposals of India in terms of flexibility of of putting tariffs on various products. And I think that tariff is important. Uh, the t- the flexibility on tariffs is important because uh, India, like any large country, has very unique issues. It's a federal country. Uh, there are many of the issues uh, on, is- on on subjects like agriculture are decided by the state governments, which are democratically elected as well. So unlike a one government rule of China, which can issue a diktat and decide that from tomorrow onwards, everybody will eat cake, uh, India has to go through a consensus building process. Uh, and therefore, uh, to, to say that uh, by joining, we will put a pressure, yes. But I think India is, is not exiting RCEP. It is engaged with RCEP. It is engaged with most other bodies. Uh, it has not cut off its links. It's just saying that let's continue to discuss. And while they continue to discuss the terms, it is improving its own uh, internal systems and the, and a very important symbol of that is the incredible rise of unicorns in India of within the COVID period we've had 30 new unicorns. Unicorn means that global organizations are putting billions into India for last mile delivery of products and services and linkages between small companies, SMEs and large organizations and creating networks within these companies. So that process is on, Joel. I'll, I'll pause on that one. And yes, issues of GI, etc. will benefit India. But uh, the, the fact is that if India can believe that there is going to be an envelope of trust around RCEP, I think India will embrace it with far more enthusiasm. Thank you, Pranjal. And you've been able to stick to the two minutes on those uh, complex, huge questions. But that uh, shows we have to keep the conversation going to next year and subsequent years. Ricardo, uh, hi. Uh, You've been able to join. We're happy with that. Ricardo, you and I have met in many countries and continents in the world. That's the first time we meet on uh, the platform. Uh, well, thank you, you. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo Melendez Ortiz, you're an economist. Uh, you've done quite a few things under the UN systems. You're a think tanker. Uh, you'll introduce yourself, but uh, taping, taking a bit of perspective on what's been said, uh, running from the business uh, and on the business side, we've seen various positions, always of hesitation because it's it's a complex uh, treaty. Politically speaking, but some businesses, or some countries, which are market economies, have decided to go and join. Some are posing, as 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 India's uh, example shows. Uh, so we should look at the RCEP itself and 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 the immediate next boundaries or of what's not the countries which are not in the RCEP. Uh, also on the government issues, uh, a few aspects have been mentioned about this kind of um, uh, not posing, but uh, you know, difficulty to ratify by some countries. Uh, and what would be the immediate next question on how to reap the largest benefit of an agreement, which is different in nature, uh, which could change the, the rules of the game uh, provided it's well implemented. This is what we've been discussing uh, till then. Uh, what are view, your views on those uh, large and huge issues? What are your own views on the RCEP uh, even beyond those issues? Uh, Ricardo, you have the floor and you may start introducing yourself in a, in a couple of minutes as well. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Joel. Can you, can you hear me well? Well, 
Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for this invitation. Just very briefly, as, as, as you said before, we've met uh, many times around the world. Uh, I've also uh, met uh, Pranjai and I, I think Lisa as well. You're very familiar, Lisa. And, uh, and I know I've read some of your, your work. Um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, I, uh, I think you, you sort of um, very generously introduced me, so I, I won't take too much time on that. But for 30 years or a bit more, I've been doing international trade and investment treaties, um, at both as a negotiator with my government and uh, as well as, as a think tanker, as you, as you put it, uh, and then now more as an independent analyst uh, in the last few years. And uh, so... Let me start perhaps responding to some of the questions that you just posed by going a little bit back in time and just say, well, you know, with the, the stalemate in the multilateral trade system, what we thought around 2014, 2015, and I was writing about this with many of my colleagues, is that we were seeing uh, something like a new uh, international trade order emerging through these mega regionals that were being negotiated then, uh, particularly the TPP then, and then the transatlantic um, uh, treaty the, 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 between Europe and the U.S. But then there were several other um, examples of deeper integration, uh, including in Latin America, even in Africa. And, and we thought, okay, that what we're going to see now is perhaps a few years of adjustment, and then convergence, and perhaps we go back to, um, to a global system uh, at that level of depth. So uh, the TPP was sort of setting the standards then uh, on issues as complicated as the ones that have been mentioned by Pranjal and by, by Lisa just now. Uh, such as, uh, as the question of subsidies, SOEs, even on the non-trade questions of, of uh, uh, environment, fisheries, even labor uh, and, uh, and trade and relations. And, and so we thought, okay, it's, it's, it seems like we have to wait maybe 10 years from 2015, and by 2025 or so, we're going to see this convergence, and then everybody's going to come back to the multilateral arena, and uh, we will have to revise the WTO agreements, and that's, that's the direction we're going. To. Then, of course, we had disruptions that came about from 2016, 17, 18, and particularly the China tension. But also, I think, um, and that goes to, to your question, then we see that actually there's no convergence, but rather there is... Um, and I, I don't believe in the fragmentation because I, we, I don't think we, we've seen it and I don't think we're going to see it, um, at least not in trade goods and commodities, perhaps in technology. But I think what we start seeing is countries having very different and, and expressing very different interests in integration. And, um, and the latest manifestation of this, I think, is not only um, what we are witnessing in that region, but particularly in Europe, and you're at the heart of that, Joel, uh, where it's clear that the Europeans are, are setting uh, themselves for something that could be defined as a value-based trade policy, um, also very aggressive in the way that it is defending its own space. With, uh, with legislation that makes it almost redundant to go into international agreements because you can take care of issues such as subsidies, issues such as labor, environment, by setting up your own unilateral or even not unilateral, but domestic uh, regulatory frameworks uh, that could substitute for that international cooperation. And then the U.S., and so sort of jumping very quickly to that, we've seen in the past few weeks, um, in a way, a disruption in the, in the region 
and in the expectations of integration in Asia with the U.S., the USCR and the, the Secretary of Commerce touring some of the key countries that, inter- that are at the intersection between RCEP and CTPPP and talking about a new comprehensive regulatory framework uh, for the Indo-Pacific region uh, in terms that are quite different from those that inform the city, that the TPP of the sort of 2014-15. So that's a lot of hoops to to go through. But but back into the region and the most immediate, um, I think in a way, um, the countries of ASEAN and China have said, have shown their cards. They're interested in trade facilitation. They're interested in, in what you could call a shallow integration process that yeah. could, could ease the continuation of the value chains in the region in an efficient manner, right? But then you have, I think, We're losing you, Ricardo, a bit due to network uh, connection. Yeah, we've lost you a lot. Uh, I'm very glad that Ricardo uh, mentioned that, uh, in a nutshell, uh, it's a process, it's a work in progress with at the regional level, within a work in progress at the global level. And I'm happy he mentioned ASEAN, which we had not touched upon much until then, very briefly. Um, we have five last minutes and we are in a system that uh, f- fiercely cuts us after five minutes. So each of you has one and a half minutes for the last word of which for which I uh, offer the following option. Either you comment on the role of Asian, is the Asian a, a winner uh, into the process? Uh, or is it getting diluted in the process? That's one option. You comment on that, or you mm, give me your final takeaways for this uh, for this conference. In the same order, yes, Unari. Sure. So let me let me brief some of the points. So as mentioned, the corporate is profit seeking, of course, and uh, of course, ASEP, as as Lisa mentioned, the uh, set of single and simplified set of origin rule is really good benefit for the most of the corporates. But however, they need to choose which FTA, which OSEP is benefic- more beneficial for them. Mm. So if these benefits are uncertain or conditional upon the administrative costs, the corporates may decide to forfeit such an opportunities. So despite the potential highly uh, preference margin. So what I want to say lastly is that it's quite important for the OSEP country and countries uh, make a really good uh, business friendly rules, rules for the corporates to use. Thank you for this takeaway. We are the food we have food for thought and you've respected the time. Okay. Lisa uh, I, I probably don't have much to comment after that statement. Um, but, um, uh, other than that, the most interesting point was on where the US is going in terms of dialogue, in terms of away from this idea of it being sort of a trade agreement towards something that's about tackling global supply chains. Um, I, I think that's more to do with domestic policy, but I think it's interesting because I think everything we are doing right now is governed by domestic politics in a geopolitical world that is very unstable um, and that is influencing everything right now. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, great takeaways uh, and uh, which will keep us busy, I'm sure, over the next months and years. Pranjal? I think uh, trade agreements will work if the approach is not founded on economic expansionism, if it it is based on economic collaboration, on equal footing, it will succeed. Otherwise, efforts like ASEP will not move ahead. Thank you very much for this uh, final takeaway from you, Pranjal. 
Ricardo, happy to see your back. Uh, during your short absence, we had been inspired by you. We talked about the, the Asian again, uh, which you brought back into our conversation and given our final takeaways as uh, in two minutes, the system will cut us. So you have, like others, one and a half minute to bring, to pull your final takeaways, final wonders uh, for the future. Well, um, thank you, and, and apologies for that. I don't know what's going on. So the, I, I think in the immediate future, um, we'll probably see an effort for uh, among the members of RCEP to, to try to integrate as fast as possible, iron out issues related to rules of origin and so on, but as I said, in a very shallow manner. But I think, uh, as I said, we'll have to probably wait at least two or three years before we can really understand where the issues are going to fall. Uh, we haven't really heard what the EU and the U.S. games are for the region, and they're absolutely critical. And uh, and we uh, are still to to see how countries in the CPTPP are going to react to China's uh, and Taiwan's and Korea's uh, requests uh, for accession. And so those are very big um, uh, moves in this in this puzzle in this chess game. Uh, and so, for, for that reason, I think that on that on the on the front of constructing frameworks, there's going to be a bit more of instability and uncertainty. That should, and I, I want to make an emphasis there because we didn't have much time to talk about this. But I think that that should not impede the continuous growth of trade in the region, and particularly the continuation of. Um, of links and as a strengthening of links through value chains in the region, which I think is and are not going to really reorganize um, as a result of COVID, as it's been said before. It's not reshoring and nearshoring that it's going to. I think we're going to go back to a, a bit of that dynamism of, um, of fragmentation in production to to make um, for efficiency. Um, uh, and, and then, of course, there's more than we have to to uh, talk about and see with respect to decarbonization and the new agendas uh, on the trade and issues. But I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Ricardo. That's very clear. Uh, the system tells me our original time session has elapsed, but we can stay as long as we want. I think the wisdom uh, calls us for uh, calling the, the session closed. My own very final uh, word of takeaway uh, would be a word of thanks to all of you for a rich debate, for an articulate debate, uh, and for outlining uh, the topics of uh, concerns, topics of attention, topics of follow-up. And I would conclude with the uh, target that those uh, kind of treaties should have to never forget the SMEs. Uh, it's difficult on the ground for the SMEs to juggle around with uh, uh, those treaties, with the proliferation of these treaties. Uh, let us reconvene in one year from now and try and see if the SME uh, has benefited uh, from uh, from the RCEP. I thank you all. Wish you a great day, a great end of the week, and that we meet again very soon somewhere. Thank you so much for the moderation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you bye very bye. much, Al. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye.